Hello. I just had to restart this because the phone just rang. Um, today I uh, went over to the city. When I say this city, I mean the inner city of where I live. And uh, did my periodical, what, a few times a year, look at the uh, couple of record shops over there. And one in particular, Real Groovy Records, which I've talked about a lot on this channel. But um, it's the largest record store in the city probably in the country, sells a mixture of new and used vinyl and CDs, mostly vinyl, mostly secondhand. Actually, not actually, maybe 50-50 used and secondhand. Um, the CDs are always a bit of a mixed bag, and what I mean by mixed bag, I mean it's not in the quality, the actual quality physically of the stock is always very good, but um, the quality of the variety and prices prices are always a wacky and I, I really don't understand how they price things up um some things are just extraordinarily expensive and then other times you'll you'll, you'll come across kind of like a, a um something cheaper than you expected today wasn't really the case i didn't really find anything except for this thing here actually there was another thing but it was so ridiculously expensive i'm not even going to mention it but uh, we have here I just took the plastic off it. This is the second-hand copy of the Broken EP from Nine Inch Nails, released in 92. Between Pretty Hate Machine, which was 89, and Downward Spiral, which was 94. Because we're on the 30th anniversary of Downward Spiral this year, aren't we? I just saw a post from um, Trent Reznor um, a couple of weeks ago mentioning that fact. And this is kind of seen as the bridge between those because whereas um, Pretty Hate Machine, you could hear them going in this direction in some of the songs, but there was definitely a real kind of 80s synth type sound in that. Um, and incidentally, the two songs that I feel were pointing in the direction of, of Broken, um, Head Like a Hole and Terrible Lie, were both produced by Flood, and Flood also produced, <coughs> or was one of the producers together with Trent on Broken, which I found interesting. Uh, this particular edition, as like that, so we see it's got the. Um, the lyrics across the two panels there and then down the bottom we got some of the liner notes um, all songs written performed and produced by Trent Reznor except 236 produced by Flood and Trent Reznor um, I'm trying to see if there's anything I'm going to read through all that uh, now some copies of this some editions now I'm pretty sure this is an edition from 1992 I'm trying, yes 1992 this was put out by TVT and Interscope. So if you know anything about um, what was happening that time with Nine Inch Nails is that they released um, Pretty Hate Machine on TVT and had pretty decent success for, for a kind of debut album at that time, sounding like that. They did pretty well, but they felt, or he felt, that TVT were getting too... They were trying to push them too much in the synth pop direction whereas he wanted to go more in the industrial metal direction i guess and so he made it pretty clear that he wanted out of the record out of the contract with tvt and i think they sold the contract to interscope which at the time he wasn't happy about but ended up being happy because he had a lot more freedom on interscope they they kind of let him do what he wanted to do and they also gave him his own label, imprint label within Interscope, Nothing Records, which you can see there. Um, and he put out some other bits and pieces on Interscope, didn't he? Uh, I'm sorry, nothing like um, Nine Inch Nails. Um, Marilyn Manson, sorry, which I'll talk about that soon as well. Anyway, so we got on this edition, we've just got the six tracks. Pinion, Wish, those two songs I always put together, because Pinion is kind of, uh, if you... Uh, I've heard it before, you know, it's like a very, sim it's like about a minute and a half that song. It's just like, eh, 
like these descending I think it's drop D power chords it's kind of like a real industrial not industrial as in music but kind of industrial as that it sounds like it's like in a factory or something um, and then it leads in directly to Wish and um, if you've ever seen any of their live performances they often start off with those two songs Pinion is a kind of walk on music uh, I think on the um, the Woodstock performance they did in 1990 what was it Woodstock 94 or Woodstock 95 the one that they did were like covered in mud they did Pinion they led off with Pinion I think also yeah anyway not important uh, last Help Me I'm In Hell Happiness and Slavery gave up gave up probably one of my favourite Nine Inch Nails songs so perfectly kind of encapsulates the teenage angsty hate <laughs> that he did very well at the time he was in his 20s and you might think well kind of um, I've heard some people say it's a bit cheesy his lyrics Trent Reason's lyrics but as a teenager listening to that song uh, really kind of encapsulates that, uh, I don't know, nihilistic, fuck everything, everything's terrible kind of feeling. Anyway, I've, like I said, did I say, I can't remember if I said this now or in the previous video, I've been looking for this for a long time. And so $12.95, $13 is more than I'd usually spend for a secondhand CD. Why would I spend $12 or $13 for this? Is because I've been looking for a long time. You don't see it often. I certainly don't. I've seen it a few times over the years, but over the last five years, I haven't seen it because I would have bought it if I had seen it. Like I said, this is over 30 years old, and with anything uh, that is 30 years old, it's going to start having some wear and tear, and that's doubly the case for these card digipack type cases, not the plastic jewel case. It's it's really hard to keep these in good condition, and especially when, some, you know, even things that are like... 10 years old, I start getting munched up a bit around the edges. And you can see this is getting some wear and tear, but it's actually in pretty decent condition for something that old made of this material. So I thought, well, I could wait and try to find the other edition that has two bonus tracks. It has uh, Physical, which is an Adam Ant cover, and um, Suck, which is a pig face cover, which I didn't even know was a pig face cover. For years, I thought that song was a Nine Inch Nails song, but... Um, I don't know which particular editions have that, if it's like a special edition or a, like a Japanese edition or, or something that, or like a re reissuing later after 1992. Uh, I really don't know, but um, Halo 5. So happy to have this, something I've been looking for for a long time, willing to spend a little bit more money on that than I, actually not a little bit, a lot more money than I would usually spend on secondhand CDs, which is usually around a dollar on average, isn't it? What else? I went up to another shop, which I've also talked about a few times. It's called Flying Out Records. And that place was kind of like my, um, kind of like a hidden gem for a long time. It kind of like seemed like not many people knew about it. And you could always find like a pretty decent handful of good CDs each time you went there. And the reason for that is because that's that store, that particular store is like 90% records, vinyl. And there's a little CD section tucked away at the back around the corner. So you can't even see it when you walk into the store. Um, most of the CDs there are new. There's a, there's a couple of shelves that are secondhand. For a long time... They were really good deals. It was like they only bought secondhand things from people to sell that they thought they could sell. And so you, it's not like the average secondhand shop was just buys everything and therefore there's a glut of like classical compilations and again, you know, all sorts of terrible stuff that never sells. This was kind of like quality stuff and they priced it really reasonably for an actual brick and mortar music store, not a charity store. You were finding things between two to six dollars. Went back today. I actually went back a couple of months ago and, and already kind of started to see it was turning. There were kind of some prices that were more than usual. And today, I realised the worm has turned completely. Um, 
and I kind of got the last two. These two were here last time I went there, and I didn't get them, but this time I thought, I'm going to get them, because probably in the future, I'm not going to have this opportunity. So I got Marilyn Manson's Portrait of an American Family, incidentally produced by Trent Reznor, and I think, yes, put out on Nothing Records. $2. That is a really good price from an actual music store. Obviously, if it was a charity store, it could be part finance for 50 cents or a dollar. But from an actual music store that sells exclusively, exclusively music, this is a, an excellent price. In saying that, I'm not the hugest Marilyn Manson fan. I've talked about Marilyn Manson quite a lot on this channel before, and I've got quite a few Marilyn Manson albums. Just looking beside me here, I can see uh, The Pale Emperor, Mechanical Animals, the Shadow of Hollywood, or it's called Antichrist Superstar. Um, do I have anything else? I think those are the five I've got. Two, three. Anyway, this one here. I've this is his earliest, his earliest work. It came out in ninety four. So this was kind of before he was even really known. Because Antichrist Superstar. Well, actually, I get Sweet Dreams, which I think was on Smells Like Children EP was what kind of broke him initially and then Antichrist Superstar is what kind of blew him up into a huge kind of star for a while there. Um, but at this time he wasn't really that well known. And the sound of this album, the stuff that I've heard of this over the years, like um, what are the songs I've heard? I've heard Lunchbox, Dope Hat, might have heard My Monkey, which I think is a, um, a Charles Manson cover. There's another one I've heard as well. Oh, Get Your Gun, that's what I've heard. They don't really have the same tone. And I don't mean tone as in like guitar tone. I mean more overall tone of his later work. His later work was a lot darker. And if you watch the video, what's the video that they film in the roller, ro uh, roller skate rink? I think that might be lunch. No, that one. That, I think that's is that dope hat. No, dope hat's the other one. Dope hat is, is that the Charlie in the Chocolate Factory one? Fuck, I'm getting all mixed up. You know, if you watch some of the videos from his early part of his career, Marilyn Manson, um, they've kind of lighter almost kind of like tongue-in-cheek a little bit. Whereas by the time he got to um, Antichrist Superstar, he was a lot more... Ooh, you know, like, um, I'm scary, and this is all deadly serious. And uh, So there's the band photo, and you can, they do kind of like a little bit lighter there, don't they? The coloured socks on. And there, yeah, the overall music sounds a little bit lighter. Not light, light is not the word for it. Um, what have we got here in the way of liner notes? Marilyn Manson, Manson would like to thank the following. Oops, that was the door. Melissa Romero. I'm not going to read through that. You, you spoon for the Saturday morning cut mouthfuls of maggots and lies disguised in your sugary breakfast cereals. The plates you made us clean were filled with your fears. These things have hardened in our soft pink bellies. We are what you have made us. We have grown up watching your TV. We are a symptom of your... God. That all sounds so like, um... I don't know. Again, teenage-ish. Now <laughs> reading that in retrospect, doesn't it? Um... Or maybe it's just times have changed and everyone's much more cynical now. And whereas back in the mid-90s, that was seen as truly subversive to be saying those kinds of things. I'm not sure. Was it really? I don't know. Anyway, two bucks for that. And then the last one, Moving Units EP, which I owned back when it first came out in, what, 2002? 2003, it says. Um... If you don't know moving units, you probably don't. I don't know how you'd really describe them. I kind of go a, a disco, disco dance, garage rock punk vibe to their stuff. 
got some good bass lines. I uh, don't really know how else to describe them. But on this EP, the songs that I would recommend to listen to if you had one. This was $5, by the way, you can see. Um, and this is very rare. And that's why I pay an EP for four songs on it for $5. But not the kind of thing. I remember when I first bought this, I ordered this off Amazon and had it shipped from America to get to New Zealand. This was, what, 21 years ago. Um, which is kind of crazy to think about now. But that's what I did. Uh, Between Us and Them and X and Y are the two songs that I'd recommend, those first two there. I also have the album. I found this a few years ago. Now, I didn't pay $21 for this. I paid 50 cents for this. I found this just by absolute chance somewhere. Like I said, Moving Units are not a famous band at all. Not something you imagine would you see around. But um, found this in a charity shop for $5. Oh, sorry, for 50 cents. So I was really shocked at the time of that. But yeah, the EP is the thing that kind of I was first introduced them. And the, the way I first heard them was back when I was at university. I was listening to the university, the student radio, BFM in Auckland. And the guy played them in the morning, Hugh Sunday, if you uh, listened to BFM in the early 2000s. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I think not bad. Seven, so five to seven plus 13, 20 bucks for three CDs, one of which I really wanted. Uh, the other two kind of, and what I was saying about these two, the reason I bought is because, so the other CDs, like I said, the, those prices there, five and two dollars, that was kind of typical. They would price between two to six dollars. And over the, the, the years, I've got some really good things from that store. However, today I saw their new stock. They were pricing at $15. Well, there was something there. What was it? Oh, that's right. P Pavement. The Pavement album, Twilight Terror. Twilight Terrors or Twilight Terror? The last album they put out before they broke up in 99. I saw that. Again, something I've wanted for a long time. Not really wanted, but if I found it for a decent price, I'd certainly picked it up. Pulled it out thinking, okay, that, what's this going to be? Between 2 and $6? Probably $6 because it's not a, a super common thing. It's fucking sixteen dollars, which is just when you're starting seeing sixteen dollars CDs second hand. I think yeah, maybe that's a, a symptom of the of the hobby. I've said this I think in the last week. The hobby becoming more popular, maybe they're cottoning on to that. Because it was back in like twenty twenty when I first came back to New Zealand. There was a period there where all of the music stores. Like Real Groovy, the place where I bought this from today. They would seem like they were just trying to get rid of CDs. And they were offloading shit really cheap. They would have these sale days, like 10 C CDs for $10. You know, you couldn't get them a dollar each. But if you bought 10 of them in bulk, you could get them for a dollar each. And I, that's how I, I made a huge part of my collection, was just getting heaps of pretty decent stuff. You know, 90s alternative rock, like Smashing Pumpkins or Alice in Chains, Supergrass, stuff like that. For a dollar each. Then, in the last year, and certainly in the last six months, it's kind of been a handbrake has been put on it. And I've seen that they're not doing that with the prices. The prices have gone way up. And now you're seeing those same kind of things I was getting for a dollar four years ago are now at eight dollars. And now some of the other stores, the same thing. The things I was selling for two dollars, four dollars are now selling for ten, fifteen, if not more. Uh, so maybe that is a sign that. They're realizing maybe that they're moving a lot of stock of CDs and they're really, okay, it seems like there's a big demand for these. So maybe we should put the price up. Maybe we don't need to be offloading these at super cheap prices. And um, also, I should say that um, this Saturday, I'm actually working. This, today's Thursday evening. What today? Tomorrow's Friday and I'm working a, a super late shift tomorrow. So I'm starting at seven o'clock at night and finishing probably around 3 a.m. But on Saturday morning, like 9 a.m., there's a uh, a record fair, like a record CD record market over in uh, another part of the city that I'm planning to go to. The only problem is that because I'm getting home at 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm not going to be able to sleep very much if I want to go out and go to that record because i got to work later on the Saturday as well. But I, I'm really kind of uh, wanting to go to that because I've that's something I haven't done. I've gone to the charity stores, the secondhand stores, 
the markets, like the Saturday and uh, Sunday morning markets, but the actual record fairs where some vendors hire out a hall and they bring in their stock and sell it as exclusively secondhand records uh, or, or CDs. I've never been to one of those before. And they're actually quite common. You see them advertised quite a lot. And I thought, this one's quite a big one. It only happens once a year, apparently. And one of the guys who I've bought from before on Facebook, he is going to have a stall there. And I thought, okay, that guy has some good stock. I bought stuff of him before a couple of times. I want to go and check out what he puts out at the market. So, um, at the record fair, sorry. So I'm planning on Saturday morning to, to go over there and have a look and maybe buy some things. I expect the prices are going to be more towards that kind of thing, like five-ish. Um, but yeah, I have no idea because I really don't know what to expect. But I think it's something different, you know. And again, it'll be interesting to see the kind of uh, ratio of records to CDs because... As much as I'm saying that CD prices seem to be going up everywhere, the, the the floor space and the ratio in these music stores hasn't changed. It's still like 80% records everywhere. It's not as though suddenly CDs are starting to kind of take back some of the floor space, some of the ratio percentage at all. So it'll be interesting to see at this record fair what what uh, what it is. Um, whether it's kind of, you know, most people are there just going through the record bins or it's equal amount of people selling CDs and records or... So, yeah, something exciting. I'm kind of, yeah, I am kind of excited to go and see what... Hopefully find some things that I um wouldn't expect. Anyway, uh, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for watching.